So you all have that friend who likes to tell that story, you know, that, that one story, and you've heard it again and again and again. Or maybe there's that story about when you were a young lad and you went wandering away from your mom and got halfway to the highway before they found you and you'll be sitting there and it'll be 30 years later and your mom will tell it on you for the 19,000th time in front of people. And We all have those stories, right, that you've heard again and again and, and maybe you're the one telling those stories, maybe not. Uh, there are stories that we hear like this that we get so used to hearing the story that the, the edges get kind of worn smooth and, and we just, we have a hard time hearing it again because as soon as I say something like, and then they started waving palms as Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, we fill in the rest of the story, right? The crowd gathers, everyone goes, yippee, Jesus, and they get to the city and then a week later that same crowd turns on him and chants crucify him. He has a very bad day, resurrection, Easter. I mean, we, we kind of know how this story unfolds. That, and if you were going to ask me as I was walking down the street, tell me about Palm Sunday, that's about what I'd tell you. You know, the crowd was cheering, yippee Jesus! And then a week later they're chanting crucify him and, and, and then Jesus has a very bad day. But, but that's just one version of the story. And you might have noticed we have four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the funny thing is, Two people can remember a, a story, a situation, so very differently, right? And so the story that I just told you, that well-worn story of, of Palm Sunday, that's actually based off the story as Mark remembers it. Matthew remembers it going down a little bit differently. And I want us to look at that today because it doesn't quite line up with how we usually tell it. Uh, and, and there's a fellow by the name of uh, Donald Versput who helped me see this because he, I was reading what he had written about Matthew and I thought, that can't be the case. And I opened up, my, you ever do this? You open up your Bible to read something you thought you knew and you read it again and go, oh, that's not what I remembered. And, and that's what happened to me this week and I hope to share that with you. So Matthew tells a little bit different story of Palm Sunday than Mark. Matthew, to get to, to understand it, we have to back up Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, Jesus starts telling his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised again. And so he's, Jesus is telling his disciples where they're going, Jerusalem, and it's going to be ugly. It's going to be really ugly for him. It's not going to go well at the, at the get-go. And so you read a little bit further on, and we get to Matthew 17, and it tells us more. They're on their way to Jerusalem now. And it tells us that as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus, his disciples, and, and many more, as they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and on the third day he'll be raised. And they were greatly distressed. When they reached Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax came to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay the temple tax? And then they get into this, this whole discussion about the temple tax. Well, what the practice of the day was, was when you showed up to pay your temple tax, you couldn't mail it in. It's like with the IRS said, you all have to go, to, isn't there an IRS place in Kansas City? Yeah, what if, that can't, if the IRS said, you, you all have to drop off your money in cash, in persons in Kansas City. And it all has to be there on April 15th. You know what would happen? The highways would just be backed up for miles, right? We would all just be in vast traffic jams all the way, all the way from here to Kansas City on April 14th and 15th as, as we were trying to get there to pay our taxes. And that's what's happening here. They were gathering because they were all on their way to pay the yearly temple tax. All the Jews spread across the entire Roman Empire have to gather to pay their half-shuckle temple tax. That's why they're talking about the temple tax at this point, because that's what they got to have the money to pay. And uh, as they're gathering across the empire, as they would sort of come together, at, at, if we were all going to Kansas City, you know where a lot of people would gather? Cameron, right? We'd all kind of get, we'd all hit that Wednesdays over by Cameron and have lunch together before we all trucked into Kansas City. It's the same type of thing. All these Jewish folk, they're coming together and they're, they're, they stop and they gather together and they have, and, not, and then they continue on. And, and it's good to travel in a crowd like that because if you're carrying money, you're carrying hard cash, you, it, it's for a bandit to try to rob one Jew is a 
that's easy. To try to rob 3,000, that would be a challenge. And so this is what was happening. We, we have history. Uh, Josephus, the historian of the time, tells us that this is how it happened. People would be gathering across the empire to, to head up to Jerusalem. And so when Jesus gathers, he is gathering not with just his disciples. There are hundreds and then thousands and then thousands of thousands of people gathered on their way up to Jerusalem. And so when Jesus had finished saying these things, Matthew 19, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea, and large crowds followed him. All these crowds going up to pay their taxes. And then in Matthew 20, this is a bit of irony, because uh, he is about to heal two people who are blind, and he's about to walk into the city that will not see him for who he is. There, there is irony in the Bible, and this is one of those cases. These two blind men say, Lord, have mercy on us. And the Lord let her eyes be opened, and he heals them. And so, Jesus finally gets to Jerusalem, at the front of these, this large crowd of people, and they're all coming on this sort of religious pilgrimage. They're, they're there for the Passover. They're there to pay the temple tax. They're there to have the biggest worship service that happens all year round at the temple. They're there for big doings, and as they're, they're being led into the city by Jesus, they have this big old shindig, and they're remembering Zechariah, or Ezekiel, which was our first reading? It was Ezekiel, wasn't it? That's embarrassing. Uh, whatever the first reading was, talking about uh, that you're going to be riding in on a donkey and that's how you know your king is coming. And so Jesus is riding in on a donkey and they're cutting off palms and they're waving them around and they're throwing their coats down in front of him. And you've got to be a pretty important person for me to put my coat down in front of you. I like my coat, right? So this is, this is a great sign of respect. And they're entering the city and yippee, Jesus, yay! And they get to the city. And, let me read you the next two verses. When he entered the Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? And then the crowd answered, the crowd that had come with him, the crowd that's all excited, the crowd on the pilgrimage with him. The crowd answered, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. And how does the city respond? <coughs> chirp, chirp, chirp. They don't. Their response is, you go to the next chapter in the book, right? They, they don't respond at all. The city doesn't care. They're kind of wrapped up in themselves. And, and then over the next week, things kind of get complicated and, and challenging. Over the next week, Jesus clears the temple, and that doesn't go over well. And then uh, he... His authority is questioned. He tells the parable of the talents, implying that the leaders of the city are not using their, their talents, what they've been given, well. And then there's the parable of the wedding banquet, which talks about how the guests you expect to show up at the wedding banquet don't. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, Pharisees and Sadducees. And then finally, Jesus wraps up by proclaiming the seven woes upon the leaders of, of the city and, and, and ends by saying... Uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And that's not a ringing endorsement for Jerusalem. Your house, Jerusalem, will be desolate until you turn to proclaim Jesus as Lord. Not, not exactly a good thing to say. And, and so at this point, it becomes clear, according to how Matthew tells the story, according to how Matthew remembers this, that it was not one crowd who was all yay Jesus and then turns on him. It's the crowd that came in with Jesus, and they were all yay Jesus. And then after the crowd leaves, they get done with the Passover, right? They get done with the Passover and they leave. That is when a different crowd, the city of Jerusalem, turns on Jesus and he is tried and crucified. And so there, it's not that the crowd was fickle, it's that the city, the city of Jerusalem, has turned on Jesus. Though it is actually consistent with what we have seen before. If you go back to the beginning of the story in Matthew, if you remember the wise men show up, they go to Herod, they say, hey, where's Jesus? Or where's this new king? And it tells us that when King Herod heard this, he was frightened. And all of Jerusalem with him. And so it's the power structure of Jerusalem that then threatens Jesus and uh, that we have the slaughter of the innocents and Joseph runs to Egypt 
with his infant son. And then when they come back after Herod has died, they don't come back to Jerusalem. They come back to Galilee, right? They go back to Nazareth and Galilee, and that's where they, they raise Jesus. And then when Jesus is resurrected, does he send the two women show up to, and they see the good news, Jesus is alive. And where does Jesus send them to proclaim the good news? He doesn't send them to Jerusalem, does he? He says to them, Greetings, come to me. They come to him, took, care, took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, for they will see me there. Don't go to Jerusalem. Just walk right past it. Just go out into the country. Go out to Galilee. Now, it would be very easy for this to become a, a rant about city folks, and then country folks get it, city folks don't. But it can't be quite that simple. For uh, the new Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, becomes the center of the kingdom of God. It's not that being in the city is inherently wrong. But there was something about how that city was functioning that kept them from seeing who Jesus was. When, if someone wall, runs into town at the head of thousands of people waving palms and saying, this is the Messiah, you think you'd pay attention. And, and why did Jerusalem just flat not pay attention until finally they killed him because he was getting so annoying? What was going on there? Why were they so walled in by this city that they didn't get it? Well, I think there were two things happening, and I think there are, there are things we've seen throughout the, the story of the gospel. The uh, city is led by two groups of religious leaders. There's the Pharisees, and they are walled off, and they can't see Jesus because they are utterly committed that they know how things are supposed to be. They know black and white. They know right and wrong. They know the good people from the bad people. They know how to tell. They, they have life figured out, right? They are rigid in their thinking. They have everything sorted. Us and them, my way or the highway. The term that comes to mind, you ever heard the, hear the term fundamentalism or fundamentalist? Fundamentalism isn't about any particular stance. It's about the way you hold your stance. Fundamentalism is saying, I'm right and you can't say anything to change my mind. Right? That, that's fundamentalism. That is being so certain about what you believe that no one else can even question you because you are right. And that's what we're seeing with the Pharisees. They can't even see that Jesus might be onto something because they have it all figured out. And so often the Pharisees are asking things of Jesus like, why aren't you washing your hands? Why aren't you fasting? Why are you doing things on the Sabbath? How dare you do these things? Because they're not lining up with what they expect and that's what they expect and that's that. They're only going to get what they expect. And so they are rigid and they can't see Jesus because they have it all figured out and they're not willing to admit that there could be something else going on out there. Now, to turn to Jesus and to follow him is to admit up front that things are going to change on you. When Jesus talks about sending the Holy Spirit, what he says is, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and the Spirit will teach you what you cannot yet know. There are things we cannot yet know and if you think you know everything, well... You're wrong. And if you think you got it all figured out, you're not following Jesus. But the Pharisees thought they did, so they, they did not see him. The other group that sort of caused this problem is the Sadducees. And they, they didn't really care about what was right and wrong. What they cared about is they knew where their bread was buttered. They had made this deal with the Roman powers, the Roman authorities, and, and they had the economic power. In every economic system, there are winners and losers, and they were the winners. They were in control of the city, and the city had all the taxes, and the city had all the sacrifices, and the city had the temple. And so, the, the, the Sadducees, they didn't care whether Jesus was right, and, or right or wrong. What they cared about was that he had come and messed up their temple, and that's where they got their income. What, he cared, what they cared about was that Jesus was talking about serving the least of these and they really didn't want to deal with that because if you started changing that, well, their bread was buttered the way things were and they didn't want to risk having that change. They were comfortable. They were just the way things were. And, and so these are the two groups vying for control of Jerusalem. And between the two of them, they had no room to see that there might be something else, that Jesus might have something to say. A week from today, we're going to make some radical claims here. We're going to stand up and we are going to say that there is a person fully human and fully God who died due to our sins, forgave us from the cross, and is resurrected from the dead so that we might not fear death. 
And that's a pretty bold claim. Let's not pussyfoot around the idea that, that that's, that's bold. That, that's a pretty radical thing to say. And I think it's worth acknowledging for a minute that as much is that does need to change how we live our lives. There are ways in which we are capable of being walled off from what Jesus has to say to us, just as much as the people in Jerusalem were. And, and let's not lose track of the fact, the people in Jerusalem, these aren't the random people out on the streets. The people in Jerusalem are the faithful Jews who live in the capital, who, live, who go to the temple on a regular basis. The people in Jerusalem are the people, they're the good people, right? They're the, they're the very faithful Jews. And they are the ones who are having this problem seeing who Jesus is. And so I think we also might need to attend to this and notice that we also can fall prey to that. We can also have a bit of Pharisee in ourselves. When we think we fully understand what Easter means and we go through the motions this week and we're just along for the ride to get to the Easter ham, that, that's a bit of Pharisee, isn't it? If you're not ready to be surprised this week, well, you're not going to be looking for it and Jesus probably has a surprise for you. And if, like the Sadducees, we are committed to doing things a certain way because that's how we're comfortable, because that's how our bread is buttered, if that's what we're used to, well, if we're not ready to say, Jesus, you done got me there, it's time to shift, then I don't know if we're really celebrating Easter all that well. And so what I want to invite you to do this week is to walk through Holy Week expecting something. We're going to go through this Holy Week as we have done time and time again, right? Many of you have done Holy Week countless times. You lose track of how many times you've gone to a Monday, Thursday service and had the Last Supper and a Good Friday and you show up for Easter. I want to invite you to pay attention and to listen well such that as we go through this week, as we follow Jesus, we are not walled off in our own assumptions and beliefs, but we are part of the crowd that's following Jesus on a pilgrimage. I, have you all ever been to a really old church, like well, a big old cathedral? And, and have you ever looked up? You know what I'm talking about? And, and you know how you look up, and, and you know how the ceiling is arched like this? Big old huge beams. You know what that's meant to look like? A boat. It's meant to look like a boat. When you, every time you're in an old cathedral and you look up and you see the great big arches, it is meant to remind you that we are in the church and the church is not stationary. We are not walled off. We are not here and only here. We are in a boat. We are on an ark on the long journey towards the kingdom of God. You are not here so that we can be walled off and stationary. You are here because Jesus calls us to get in this boat and take this journey together. Amen.